So, in a not unsurprising turn of events, this topic became a multi-parter. Yes, it did. It became a multi-parter. And as such, it's also being re-recorded for a second time, because what happened was I recorded it first Friday, actually. And... I like that, but today I was at a bakery, and I was thinking things through, and I was thinking, hmm, can I do it better? Can I do a better version? And so, that's what I'm doing. I came back with a nice cheese bun, and by the way, that's a cheese bun is a, or, or a cheese bap depending on who you are. Here's a, a little bat that's been baked with cheese on the top. As it's been baked. Really, really nice. So, I, of course, divided this topic up into two lives and two long patrols. And I divided it up in terms of the Mediterranean and European theatre, but very carefully avoiding the Baltic and the Black Sea. And the Pacific, Baltic and Black Sea. Now, why am I dividing up so? Well, whilst you have rather a similar conclusion in how the ships end up, how these little boats end up, you have a differing story because the vessels which are involved in the European and Mediterranean theatre very much develop the way they do because of how they start off and what kind of missions they're on for. They end up doing a lot of convoy work, convoy attacking work. They end up doing, they start off and they have almost an anti-submarine warfare orientation with a little bit of torpedo, uh, with torpedoes to do its attacks on major ships, and they basically do the whole sort of thing. They go from, it's like aircraft in World War One. They turn from the spotter or anti-submarine warfare aircraft that are out there hunting for things and seeing what's going on, to, well, you know, we can lay eggs ourselves, I drop bombs or use torpedoes to take out major targets, and then fighters come along because the. What's the best way of killing them? Well, you want rapid-firing weapons on your ships, but if you're going to stop these small, fast things getting to your convoys of merchant ships, well, you can't have a big ship with rapid enough. You won't have enough big ships with rapid-firing guns to be everywhere you need to be for all the convoys you have to need to having to go up and down the coast. So, you know, you develop your own torpedo boats, which turn into motor gunboats in order to engage them. But the Pacific, the Black Sea and the Baltic, well, they develop into a gun-heavy formation because of littoral combat. Rather than necessarily fighting each other, although that does happen quite a lot, they develop a lot of their capabilities because of the amount of times they're used to assist ground forces. And yes, in the European theatre, Mediterranean theatre, there's some very famous accounts of motor torpedo boats being used to assist ground forces and involved in command operations. But the thing is, for a lot of the Pacific War, the Baltic and the Black Sea, a lot of operations are riverine, a lot of operations are... Island hopping and manoeuvring around islands in sort of shallow waters. And these torpedo boats become the escorts for landing craft for all sorts of movements. Movements They are providing the fire support. And so this leads to a similar conclusion in that they change from being a torpedo depth charge heavy design to being a gun heavy design by the end of the war. But it has a different story. And that's why it made sense to divide them up. Because to cover both 
of those pieces of history, those stories, properly, it's nicer to do it divided. And it's nicer to do two lives on it. And hopefully everything balances out. So, Patron85 is managing to grow mahusively. Shameless book plug. Now, there are people who sometimes wonder why I put the shameless book plug in every single video. Well, there are two reasons for it. One, this is my only book, and I really want it to do well. And in fact, due to your support, it's got a second edition com that's coming out in October, which is the paperback edition. First edition was hardback. And the fact it's, it's got all this stuff coming through is down to your support. But also, there are two other reasons. One, in academia, in history, you, no one else is going to advertise you. No one else is going to make the case for you but you. They really don't. If you want your books to sell, you have to advertise them. You have to talk about them on Twitter. You have to talk about them on Facebook. You have to talk about them on YouTube. You have to talk about them on Twitch. You have to talk about them everywhere you go in order to get them to be advertised. And give them a chance of selling. If you want to have a good example of that, there is... I've got his book somewhere here. I was reviewing it earlier. Um, Simon Elliott, a friend of mine, who is a specialist in sort of Roman history and Roman archaeology. He shamelessly advertises all his books as hard as he can. And he does well because of it. And to an extent, especially at the moment with universities informally delaying issuing contracts to some of their, uh, their contract staff this year to try and sort of deal with financial issues and sort themselves out, etc. Well... My income stream at the moment is entirely the book and the videos, YouTube. That's my income stream. And so I have to look to people like Drakenafel, like Simon, like all these colleagues and see how they're doing and model myself to an extent on them to try and find my own way of being self-sufficient so that I'm less affected by universities going, hmm, we love you, we love you not. We love you, we love you not. Saying that, if any universities are watching and going, hmm, well, we need someone to do some contract lecturing role. I'm always happy. I'm happy with a permanent post as well, but um, judging by a recent conversation I had, they weren't happy with the idea of me doing it, still doing YouTube and also having a permanent post. Um, I didn't see how what I did with my free time in terms of YouTube, in terms of putting naval history content out, affected them. But they decided to go with someone else. Say la vie. But to me, that's because the community and naval history here is important. So, let's get back into the topic. World War One. You see, motor torpedo boats have been around before World War One. They really had been around for a while by World War One. There have been all sorts of ideas about how to use them, about what they could be doing. And the Royal Navy had started working on them in about 1910. They developed coastal motorboats. These were 15 tons, thereabout. And they are great little vessels. They really are. They are... Great little vessels. And some of the operations they do are frigging insane. But some of the torpedo boats that are used are even smaller. And 
some of the operations that take place in World War One that actually win VCs are done by torpedo boats because of the insanity of the actual operations. But they were giant killers. They were fighters of the sea. They were these things where you'd have a very small crew, you'd have your torpedo and you'd be charging in. It was full of dash and glamour. It was full of emotion. And, as I said, they're giant killers. And that's what torpedo boats begin to be seen as. But the thing is, they're also weapons of war. And that makes things very interesting. Because in the case of Britain, you have a huge maritime industry and infrastructure. Post, still existence, post World War One, And the Royal Navy pretty much goes... Do we need to keep these around? Do we need to have a large number of them? Do we need to actually have them to maintain our small boat manoeuvring skills? If the answer to any of this is no, it's better to not have them and build them up when we need them. And so, in some regards, they disappear post-World War. But the idea of them being giant killers continues. However, they don't disappear entirely. Not everyone does get rid of them. In fact, the mass bots, the Motoscafo Armato Silante of the Regia Marina, oh, they continue on. They displaced roughly 20 tons. And they would kill the largest target killed in World War One by motor torpedo boats, and actually the largest warship to ever be taken out by motor torpedo boats, the Svunt Istvan, the Austro-Hungarian Dreadnought, is taken out by a mass boat, and they weigh 20 tons. They grew to roughly 30 tons, but the design stayed pretty much the same by uh, to World War Two, And they were a constant evolving thing, but they also keep to over the same formula. Um, remove everything and add lightness. They are very light and very fast. The aim was to get them as fast as they physically could be, and, well, 40, 45 knots was fair. Some were clocked as going even faster. And they could do. You know, 42 knots is the normal, normal one that they would claim to. But again, things could be changed. And they got used in lots of places in World War Two. This, this vessel is 1942. And it's Taking during the siege of Leningrad on Lake Ladoga, Ladoja. It's out there pulling duty, and it's a thing you don't necessarily think about. Siege of Leningrad, torpedo boats, but they're there. The Italians have brought their torpedo boats. And this is in 1942, when they're still definitely Italian. They managed to disable the Molotov, a Soviet cruiser, in August 1942. But there is a problem with these ships. They are very much World War One. Era murder torpedo boats. And it's something the Italians found out quite quickly was a problem. 
as beautiful as they were, as fast they were, and if you could get one of these vessels and turn it into a sail, uh, you know, a day yacht, a cruising yacht for yourself and your family, you would have a lovely vessel to do it with. Because it would be absolutely perfect on the right day. But, it was also a bit of a fair weapon vessel. This one. This one you see in front of you. Not really designed for rough seas. And because so much of their weight and displacement was orientated around their torpedoes, they didn't really have much space to have their gun armament upgraded. And so, when you start dealing with... Well, I would love to say it's the rush of British motor torpedo boats coming in, and they are an impact, yes, but actually more of an impact on Italian motor boats and motor torpedo boats in terms of their operations are 4-inch anti-aircraft guns. Why? Because the twin 4-inch AA mount rapid firing if you did a little bit of modification with the right chief petty officer might be listed as a high angle mount but it could be turned into a dual purpose mount so do the high angle very well but could also fire down and it was found very quickly that four inch anti-aircraft shells shred motor lightly skinned motor torpedo boats now, the thing is, they're designed to use their high speed to make that very difficult to do. But, again, due to their size and their construction, their framing, everything being orientated around this high speed, around being these very, very fast boats. and They're not very good at dealing with rough weather and even the Mediterranean can get rough and it slows them down that's the first thing that happens in rough weather you slow down second thing that happens is eventually you sometimes you get start topping around so much that you frankly your crew can't do anything the third thing that happens is that you're topping around so much you actually boat your boat flips over um, you usually try and work things out before then the record for staying out in the roughest weather in World War two goes to the Fair Maldives. There is a debate as to which retained their speed better in rougher weather, the Ds or the Schnellboots, and we'll get into that discussion later. But the thing is, the Ds start from a lower top speed anyway, but their broader beam means that they do tend to retain speed better. So at a certain point, they actually... in rough enough weather in North Sea actually end up being effectively faster than the Chanel boots. In the Mediterranean, it's rare that it gets so rough, but still the Mediterranean does have seasons, and whilst it's normally as calm as a mill pond, it's not always the same. And this starts to affect them. There's also a problem that if you wanted to start adding in more things, the things you might need for night op or to make night operations better etc all the extra weight and stuff you would need to add in to make these vessels useful for maybe escorting your convoys across the mediterranean they don't have the space or flexibility for that you can still use them for it and you can still start adapting them but every time you make those adaptations you are actually making the vessel viably worse for its primary role and as such you end up almost defeating it, being able to, you know, defeating it yourself. But still, it's what have kept the idea of torpedo boats fresh in everyone's mind for all those those years. Then we have the Reichsmarine, the Rombot. Now, first things first. These were more common than the Schnellboot. The, uh, which are often described as e-boats. There is also another small problem. E-boat literally translates as enemy boat. And quite often, 
especially in some accounts by sailors who weren't sure quite what they were bashing to into the middle of the night, they just file it down as e-boats. And then you get some authors who don't seem to realise that Germany had more than one type of motor torpedo boat and more than one type of vessel which was going around doing similar roles. Well, they then decide they're all Schnell boats. And the thing you have to really take into example is these are minesweepers. That's what they start off as. They li it literally their name literally translates as clearing boats. But and they do have variations of their design as they're built and as things go on. But a total of four hundred and twenty four of these are built for the Kriegsmarine before and during World War II. 424. If we're talking about the Schnellbert, well, a total of... 195 of those are built in total. But quite a lot of them have been sold off to the Spanish and other people before war even begins. So more than two to one of these sort of Schnell books. So therefore, it's kind of like, I'll use the example, whenever you're talking to Luftwaffe pilots about what shot them down, they were shot down by Spitfires. And you look at the records and you go, there weren't any Spitfires operating at that era. Era, and, you know, that area was had no Spitfires. It's hurricanes. Oh no, we were shot down by Spitfires. You can't have been. It's similar with some of the reporting about Schnellboots and E-boats. We were attacked by these. No, you weren't. Now. With the Rambot, there are quite so many, and they are quite so variant, that it's important to be sure quite what you're dealing with. Because the first six were 60-ton vessels. You know, they have a length of 26 metres. They have a, bre a beam of 4.4 metres. But the R-300s, which were armed with two 21-inch torpedo tubes, well, they're 160 tons. They are 41 meters long, and they are 6 meters in beam. I would also add these vessels were incredibly important to the growth of the Kreese Marine and its transmission into the Reichsmarine. Why? Or rather, growth of the Reichsmarine and transition into the Kriegsmarine. Sorry. The German Navy, the only one I have to remember. Which year? Kaiserlich Marine, Reichsmarine, Kriegsmarine. Yeah, okay. Reichsmarine. They're important to the growth because they're where a lot of junior officers get their experience. A lot of junior officers are sent to learn their skills in these vessels. It inoculates a lot of the senior officers as well who serve in World War Two, A lot of the senior ones who go on to far more senior ranks are officers who were going around in charge of mine sweeping flotillas and all, all those sort of things. Why? Because they were spaces where the German Navy could hide people. No one can really testify to how many senior officers you need for a minesweeping flotilla that's still dealing with mines that were, might have been laid in World War One. You can make the case for needing a lot of experience. You aren't allowed more than X number of large ships. That restricts your pool of senior people. You have to be creative in how you're going to use them. One of the things that's interesting about the Reichsmarine during the interwar years, 1920s and 30s, is the sheer number of officers 
it has. It's a very officer-heavy organization. And they're doing this in many ways to try and prepare their organization for rapid expansion. But again, this does create problems because if you're an officer-heavy organization, what does it, that usually means you're going to be an NCO light organization. And that can cause you problems. Now, the Rambats, they are incredibly successful. They're operating in the Baltic, the Mediterranean, the Arctic, the Black Sea. They are everywhere. North Sea, Atlantic Wall, they're there. Wherever Germany is, you can count a round boat is going to be somewhere around there. They are more often than not the presence. They are more often than not the capability of these vessels. Even post-World War II. Post-World War II. They are still around and still being used. Now, these vessels. This is an Aldebaran vessel. And those are the vessels built for the Bundesmarine in 1956. They are based on the R-41 design, which was built 1939-1943. Displaced roughly 125 tons. And was roughly 37, 38 meters long. Roughly 6 meters in, in beam. Again... These vessels are armed with a couple of 20 millimeters, but they are very flexible assets for patrol duties, for convoying, for mine sweeping. And that's what they're used for. This is, these small craft are flexible tools. But one of the interesting things is to fit there is, I think, is quite how early the Germans are having to start their construction programs. They're having to lock in their designs, lock in their systems, far earlier than the British, the Americans, even the Japanese are going to have to, because of their maritime infrastructure. Even small vessels, small vessels, that are supposed to be rapid construction, they are locking in early, because they do not have the breadth of maritime infrastru infrastructure left. Thanks to... Well, they didn't start off with as much in World War One and before World War One anyway, but the Treaty of Versailles, the entire f f section, as I often mention in our videos, the British cared about was stopping the Germans being able to build up again. Well, they did that. They did that successfully. And here is the Schnellboot. Now, let's be honest, looking at them, if we look at these lovely vessels, you can sort of see why one captures the imagination slightly more than the other. It's kind of like the Spitfire again with the sexy wings versus the Hurricane. They're both good aircraft, but one has sexy wings. And so... It's the one which everyone really focuses on, because it sticks out. It looks cool and different. A lot of effort is put into making these vessels as seaworthy as possible for their size. A lot of effort is. And whilst these particular ones pictured, I've got a variety picture there. You know, we've got the S1, which was actually sold to Spain before even the Civil War, I think. Uh, you've got others which were built for the Yugoslav Navy and some built for the Italian Navy. This one. Uh, the Italians had problems. They built their own Schnellboots. Um, 
again, it's an interesting one. I'll be getting into the CRDA 60s later because they have an interesting story. And some people put them down as going, well, they are derivatives of the Schnellboot, but actually they are derivatives of a specific type of Schnellboot. And they developed from that. But the point is about all these vessels, again, it's about building a flexible platform, but it's a very torpedo oriented flexible platform. And that's a problem for them. It is really a problem for them because they can have some 20mm cannon. Eventually they have a 37mm cannon fitted. Uh, they have two 21-inch torpedo tubes and carry four torpedoes. You are supposed to load torpedoes whilst at sea maneuvering. The idea was they'd fire two, break off, Cycle, load their torpedoes, come back and fire some more. Now, yes, they had systems to make this possible and make this work. Hmm, that's always helpful. And yes, they are very capable. But they're also very, very light. There are a hundred tons maximum. If it's rough weather, all your systems, everything, it only takes some hard hits from the waves and you have problems. And you're loading torpedoes. Oh, they were a brave crew. But mostly they acquitted themselves well. The Royal Navy had a lot of problems dealing with them. You can tell that from the sheer quantity of vessels the Royal Navy built that had dealing with them functioned into them. You could talk about the fact that the... Honestly, the flower class is inclusion of a 4-inch gun. And the... Uh, specific type of mounts chosen for their 40 millimeters are reflection over a worry about torpedo boats um that's not silly with what the Royal Navy had got up to in World War one in them they knew just how capable these vessels were and also what the Germans had got up to them in uh, up to with them in World War one but the first thing you find that's built in rather large quantities is the Royal Navy's Harbour Defence Motor Launch. Now, we are fairly certain 486 of these are completed. They are designed by the Admiralty in early 1939. They passed the instructors to instructions on how to build them to yacht builders in the UK and various Commonwealth, Empire, and other allied countries, and then they started building them. They had rounded bilge, they had a heavy displacement hull of 72 feet and a beam of 16 feet, so that's roughly 22 meters by 4.9 meters. And their draft was just 5 feet, 1.5 meters. They had two marine engines, gunners, uh, and they were capable of a top speed of 12 and a half knots, with a range of 2,000 nautical miles at 10 knots. Pretty much. It's one of those interesting things. They sometimes list the range as 1,700 nautical miles at 10 knots, and then at some point 2,000, and at some point 2,500. And the question seems to be their configuration. For example, this one is at Padstow, and is pictured at Padstow, loaded with extra fuel tanks and stores for the voyage to Malta, where we take on as part of the protection there. And once you start adding in the extra fuel, the range can change dramatically. So their initial range, I think, is roughly 1,700 nautical miles. Their standard long-range configuration is probably roughly 2,000 nautical miles. 
and I wouldn't be surprised if the higher ranges with every single extra fuel tank they could have added, fitted, they can do that. They have a crew of two officers, two petty officers, and eight ratings, so 12. They're armed with twin 20mm, twin Vickers K machine guns, and six depth charges. And as far as the Kriegsmarine were concerned, and as far as they seemed to feel about them, were constitutionally incapable of turning up in anything less than a pack. Um, I'm fairly sure there are examples of them doing independent solo voyages, etc. But... They were often known for not, and as far as the Germans were concerned, whenever they saw them, they were they were seeing a lot of them. Now, they could also be fitted with a three pounder gun. Uh, they could also be fitted with two pounder. That's a forty a pom pom, forty millimeter. Um, there is an example of one which apparently was going around uh, with a three pounder, a, a two 20 millimeter Oricons, two machine guns, a two pounder, and eight depth charges. They, they, they seem to have a very much a, um, a desire. A constant desire to improve their armament. They were used by the Royal Australian Navy in New Guinea and Timor. They were escorting convoys off the west coast of Africa. They took part in all sorts of random operations, and uh, including. Uh, Glimmer and Taxable, which were, of course, the de uh, deception operations to draw the Germans away from Normandy, Normandy. They are a constant part of that, and many of them were crewed by Royal Navy Volunteer Reserves. I, well, officers and hostilities only ratings. So many of them were crewed by people who had very limited naval experience. Saying that though, they did kind of get a reputation for um, not understanding when they were outgunned or outnumbered and very, very skilled handling of the vessels. For vessels with top speeds of, theoretically, at least when I'm saying this, Theoretically, 12 and a half knots. They were amazingly convinced they could catch our things when they wanted to. But of course, they're already starting out as a sort of gunboat. Then we have this. The Royal Navy's Vosper 70-foot motor torpedo boat. Now, Vosper... Oh, Vosper. Uh, they could have been an entire video of their own. They really could. Vosper have this desire that they want to build for everyone their perfect motor torpedo boat. So you want one which is longer than 70 feet? Well, you got 73 feet. 72 feet? 71 feet? You want that? You don't want a 70 foot, a 70 foot vessel? Okay, we've got 45 foot, 60 foot, 68 foot. You know, you name it, we can we can build it for you, sir. We can build it for you, sir. Uh, their salesmen were as persistent as the Vickers 14-inch gun salesmen were. They're good little boats. They are good little boats. But they are very much motor torpedo boats. And they are very much armed with 21-inch torpedoes, depth charges, machine guns, and... 20 million Oricons. That is what they're built around. Now, the 70 foot vessels were, could also carry four depth charges, and they were probably the most common of the type. 
Believe it or not, at one point, the Royal Navy has, in World War II, I think six different Vosper motor torpedo boat types serving with them. Including their Vosper's private venture 45-foot motor torpedo boats, which were actually were built. Um, the Admiralty decided they were far too poor at sea keeping and not going to be used for, uh, for combat. But they found useful employment. Um, the 60-foot motor torpedo boat was based on the... Um, the high-speed launches used by the RAF for air sea rescue. They could carry 18-inch torpedoes and had a maximum speed of 33 knots. The Royal Navy ordered them in 1936 and the 18 of them were pretty useful. But they were also very useful for causing interesting issues for their opponents in that the Royal Navy had a habit of, well, you know, they only had 18 of those vessels in service, yet their favorite photo to send around was of number 23. And that's the other thing you can do with motor torpedo boats, and it is a big factor in World War II. It's no one's really sure how many of them you have, especially when you're dealing with infrastructure and maritime industry of the scale of the British Empire of Britain and America. You know, the Germans are always convinced the Royal Navy has more D class, uh, fair mile Ds than they do. And I'm fairly certain the IGN believed that the US was literally just going with their PT boats because every they seem to be just constantly appearing more and more and more and more and more and more. Especially when you start to see the, the newsreels and the pictures of them and the numbers that are being claimed. Now, um, if we consider the 70-footers, they were numbered 31 to 40, 57 to 66, 73 to 98, 222 to 245, 347 to 362, 380 to 395, and 523 to 537. And that's the official numbers, not the numbers their crew somewhat at times painted them, uh, painted them with. What number boat were you attacking? We have no idea. And now we get into the Fairmile family, which start off with the Fairmile A. Now, there are 12 of these built. And they are literally built almost the same idea as the Harbour Defence Motor Launch. But, These are being built because the Royal Navy wants something to go chasing submarines in littoral waters. Remember again, I've said this before in other videos, the Royal Navy has fears of submarines. They have fears of the kind of war they could end up fighting. Mine laying submarines had caused tremendous trouble in World War I. Well... They were worried about them. And they are building these vessels to go and hunt down submarines. Which also explains their slight differences to the other more traditional motor torpedo boat designs going on. But the Fairmile A's and the Fairmile family is important to consider because of where they go to from here. The A has a hard chine. It's a planing hull. And it's optimized for speed and the expense of range. But still, it can do a, theoretically, only 25 knots. And has a range of 600 miles at 12 knots. But, what does it have which is really useful? It has Aztec. It has a quick-firing 3-pounder Hotchkiss gun. It has a pair of .303 inch Lewis machine guns. And it carries 12 depth charges. So you're getting an Aztec-equipped ASW platform. 
That can do 25 knots. And you can automatically have them hunting around in packs. But the A has issues. So what does the Royal Navy do? They go. Let's start on the B. And so we've talked about the fact that the Rombot, there were 400 of those. And there are roughly 200 Schnell boats built, although never that many in service with the, uh, with the Kriegsmarine. We talked about the Harbour Defence, uh, uh, Harbour Defence motor launch, the HDML, and it's nearly 500. Well, here comes in the Fairmile B, roughly 650. In fact, here is the actual issue. No one's actually quite sure how many were actually finished and completed. We have figures. But depending on how you do the sums, in terms of ending up in actual service during the wartime, you end up in a range from 645, 46, depending on the source you read, to as high as 660. We know that roughly 100 are completed post-war by various sources and sold off as pleasure craft and various other things they converted in. Roughly. We know roughly how many were ordered, but the trouble is, rather like with flower class corvettes, etc., at a certain point, some yards were just building them on the presumption they were going to get the order, so they might as well carry on building it. They hadn't been given an order for anything different, they knew these were still needed, so they just kept building them. And this might explain how there is one boat. There is a fair mile B, apparently, and this has been recorded by a historian who's far, far more into this than I am, is writing a book on the subject. They've not allowed me to use their name, and they I don't want to go into too many videos because I don't want to basically steal the front of their book. But basically, they think the most famous of the Fairmile Bs in terms of operations and what it achieved might not have officially ever been ordered. Because they've gone through and they think it was built before the Yard received an order. They're not even sure if the Yard actually received payment for it. But it was it. It was then equipped to a unit. It was available. A unit was short, of, uh, short and there was this boat available. So they took the boat and then they go do something. And yeah. They're trying to track down the paperwork as we speak. Uh, initially armed roughly the same as the A's, i.e. a quick-firing three-pounder, which you can see where it's positioned, uh, a twin .303 machine guns and 12 jet charges. By later in the war, the base armament for many of the vessels, and please note I'm saying base armament, was a three-pounder, Twin point three or three machine guns, a twenty millimeter Oricon, and a forty millimeter Bofors. However, some of them had forty millimeter pom poms. Some of them were going around with twin forty millimeter pom poms. Not quite sure where they got them, but they did. Um, which they replaced their three pounder with. Some of them seem to have managed to get some of the auto six pounders potentially. That come from other vessels in their family tree. It's basically known that <sighs> I'm going to be using a stereotype here and it's a, it's the humorous version of stereotype, you know. You have this joke sometimes about the people who are the most pro, most desiring of I don't know, gun ownership. Where you go, so what guns do you have? And they go, yes, i.e. they have a huge collection. Well, those gentlemen and ladies, however enamoured and articulate and focused they are in terms of their spending and acquisition of weapons, were not, were not, to use the more proper English phrase, uh, phrasing on that rather than Liverpudlian, were not 
compared to the crews of the various Fairmar Bs. Someone commented in my video under the live that, you know, there would be a British, a, a Royal Navy logistics officer asking him, so you want ammunition for an Italian cannon? Yes. How did he get an Italian cannon? We found it. We're in Scotland. I'm not sure if they... They didn't use the Scotland example, but they did use the Italian cannon. Well, the Scotland example comes from a real one. There are actual cases where they're going, How have you got this insert gun name here? And there seems to be a growing collection of basically... There almost seems to be a... How do I put this politely? An ad hoc circulation of weapons going on through the war zones where freighters would sometimes... Their crews would get... Ex, uh, uh, borrow, would get extra weapons to try and put something on their own ship to give themselves some protection in case of air attack or something. And then when they got into harbour... They may be in a back, you know, back in the UK. They'd sell those weapons or give those weapons to their friends who are in the torpedo boats who protected them on the way in or something like that. You know, as a, a bit of a reward. Oh well, we can't keep this gun going. You know, would you like it? Yes, please. We'll figure out how to keep it going. That's the only way I can really explain the movement of weapons. That and maybe some actual warships brought some back from them. But the point is. This picture, and m quite a lot of the pictures you see of these vessels, and this one's flying its black sig flag, signaling it's got an Aztec contact and is prosecuting it. And they were not nice for submarines, because if you think about that, what do you have to fight that if you're a submarine? Well, you've got your deck guns, and they, they should win the fight. But the trouble is, you think that, well, you've done what you should do, be able to. That does any damage to you, you're not submerging again. And also, they are usually hunting in packs. They usually have friends. And if you have to serve it, because you can't really use a torpedo to engage it, because it's too shallow in the water. <laughs> they can outrun some torpedoes. But no. Um, and the pictures, I always love the pictures, because they are either early in the war, when they've recently come into service. Or alternatively, you can almost tell they've either been sanitized by the wartime sensors or sanitized by some naval officer going, not sure how they got that, how they got that. Or alternatively, their, ca their captain has gone, take these things off the stands, put them away. They won't notice the stands. And then you look at the pictures and you go, that's a that's a gun stand without a gun on it. Where is the gun? What is the gun? I'm just imagining some admirals at certain points look at certain points looking out into their dockyards and going, ah. We have ten of those fair bees in the water in there. Yeah, that's good. Looking back five minutes later, we have twenty out there. Where'd they come from? They just kept multiplying. Then we have the fair mile C. Now the fair mile C is then basically going. Let's try and actually make a motor gunboat from the Fairmar B. Let's see what we can do. And so here is their weapons list as de designed. Uh, a standard quick-firing two-pounder pom-pom uh, Mark 2C. A Rolls-Royce quick-firing uh, two-pounder Mark 14. Four 0.5 inch, that's 12.7 millimeter, Vickers machine guns in two twin mounts. Uh, four 0.303 inch, that's 7.7 millimeter, Vickers machine guns in two twin mounts. Very quickly after being launched, they gained, well, up to 
six twenty millimeter cannon in four single or two uh, uh, and four single and one twin or two twin and two single mounts. They also normally carried four depth charges. And whilst they theoretically had a crew of 16, that's two officers, two petty officers, and 12 ratings, they also had a habit of acquiring extra and extra of everything. Now, these vessels were not quite as massively produced as the B. Uh, they are a reuse of the A's hull form, but it's been modified a bit more, so it's sort of a bit between the B and the A. And they had a top speed of 26.5 knots, or a range of 500 nautical miles at 12 knots at standard bunkerage. They built 24 of them. Five were lost. 19 retired. Now, in terms of their service and their history, it must be noted that these are some of the vessels that take part in St. Nazaire. And they're very capable little boats. But, they're the starting point for what's coming. If you're going to ask what's coming, well, what's coming is what many Axis navies who met them thought was physically impossible. So before we get there, we should see the vessel which has a many, a many people claiming its heritage. Now... The Rager Marina, CRDA 60 ton, is built because, well, the Italians have a look at the Schnell boats they capture from the Yugoslav Navy. And they decide that, frankly, that's got some good ideas. But they Italianify it, thankfully. They do Italianify it. So they take Schnell boats, which were earlier Schnell boats, and they're a basis that then goes from an Italian perspective. So these are not copies of e boats, Schnell boats by any stretch of imagination. And they are, though, very successful in that they are capable of an delivering a lot of damage, and actually do achieve the sinking of the largest vessel by torpedo boats in World War II. HMS Manchester, yes, a town-class British light cruiser. An elder sister, sort of, of HMS Belfast. So, the mass boats got the Svent Istvan in World War I, the CRDA 60s got the Manchester in World War II. The Italians really did love their torpedo boats. Now, why have the Italians decided to go with Abercraft? Well, this is it post World War II. This is it after its 1950s upgrades. Because for the Mediterranean, it's a very successful tool. Think about it, the Mediterranean is not particularly massive, so range they don't need as much. But you're always going to be in air range, uh, the air operating radius and air range of someone. So you either need to be heavily armed and able to fight off all comers, or you need to be fast enough that you can make it difficult for all comers to find you, to attack you. The Italians only completed 36 of these. They lost 22. Two are preserved. Their standard armament when built was two 533mm torpedo tubes, that's 21 inch, two 450mm torpedo tubes, that's 18 inch, 
and four twenty Breda twenty millimeter cannon and depth charges. As you can see, the uh, later vessels received a bit of a gun upgrade. It's not bad. Their changes included the removal of the uh, 21, uh, 21 inch uh, torpedo tubes and the equipping of a 40mm Bofors fore and a 40mm Bofors aft and the ability to carry over their 18 inch torpedoes or mines at the rear. Basically, when designing these and building these, the Rage Marina is seeking something to give themselves the flexibility back that the mass boats have lost with their pursuit of speed. It is sad that so many are lost. A number of them are lost in the Sicilian campaign. A number of them are lost in various fights with allied destroyers. The problem is, by the time they're entering service, they're not in enough numbers to be really flexibly used. And so when they are used, they tend to run into actually a numerical superiority of destroyers. And that's the worst thing. Because you have to remember, the original name for a destroyer was Torpedo Boat Destroyer. Which is why my book's name is Tribal Battles and Darings. TBD. Torpedo Boat Destroyer. Running into a pack of them that outnumber you is not good. And now we have the Fair Mile D. Okay. So you can tell these are very sanitized photos. Because if you look at them, the way the uh, rest of the photo has been either lightened or um, scraped to make it easier to hide things. If you see photos like this, that's usually a clue that something's been doing, done to somewhere. It's somewhere. And sometimes there's a whole lot of something done to cover up a very small bit of something. Now these are first ordered in 1941. They come into service in 1942. 229 are planned, 228 are completed, one is cancelled. What can I say about them? Well, the Royal Navy basically goes, oh frigate, we're getting beaten up here by the Schnell boats. They are coming in, and the round boats are even are coming in, and there's fights, and it's an even fight. They've got roughly the same amount of firepower as the Vospers, 70-footer. They've got roughly similar firepower to an individual harbour defence motor launch, or Fair Mile B, theoretically. Their crews are soon searching for extra weapons to add on to them, but, you know... And the fact that they are less worried about technically the top speed means they can be very interesting when it comes to weapons acquisition. But still, it's theoretically an even match in terms of firepower. Royal Navy doesn't want it to be an even fight. The Royal Navy doesn't like even fights. Even fights are not what the Royal Navy signs up for. And so, we have the Fair Maldives. But, I will say something now. If anyone ever tells you there is a standardised weapons fit for them, then they are reading off the as, as commissioned list. Because even the Royal Navy 
uses phraseologies on occasion like sample armament configuration or base armament configuration or standard armament basis. So, let's put it this way. Their starting point is two single or uh, six pounder guns, which were the very nice and very much illustrated here uh, <clears throat> quick firing six pounder gun. Now, quick firing six pounder is a 57 millimeter. So, if you're wondering about it, yes, they are carrying two guns, the size of which are used by things like the LCS. Not in the same calibre barrel and all those things, but yeah. They are very, very rapid firing. And you can see those little smaller pictures on the side of the sailors standing around them. They'd have two of those. Now, they'd also have at least four 20 millimeters. Uh, two single and a twin. Now, I would say something about this in that there were a couple which may have exchanged their twin 20 millimeter for something a little heftier. Again, a lot of pom poms were going around Britain this time. Please note, whenever factories said, How many pom poms and 40 millimeter barrels do you want? The Royal Navy's answer was yes. So there are a lot going around the UK. And there's also a lot of Bofors 40mm going around. So goodness knows what's going on that one. Plus a load of Italian 40mm at various points. So, yeah. Just, you're getting the point that the 20s might have found themselves changed to 40s. At least two twin Vickers, uh, 0.303 Vickers K guns, which again could find themselves changed because, you know, which is more useful? Your 20s or your four, uh, your 20s or your 0.303s? For uh, what are called, uh, well, four depth charges, but they're of the um, torpedo boat variety. Searchlight and um, a smoke generator. That was roughly in gunboat configuration what they could be. But the fact is, they are incredibly flexible. Two of the captured vessels were actually put in the Kriegsmarine service, because the Kriegsmarine went, we like this. But pretty much, they are a movable feast of firepower. They have a top speed of 29 knots, which if we consider, well, Chanel boots were often in their 40s, and theoretically the one which is normally given is roughly 44 knots. So they are theoretically a lot slower. But they also would have radar and various other things, and they tended, tended, especially once you get into squat box and various other systems which actually tend to just pick up German radio broadcasts. Quite a lot of vessels, destroyers, torpedo boats, are fitted up with systems which allow them to just listen into German radios because the Germans transmit so loudly. And they actually would use that radio, informa radio information to position themselves in ambush. There are many German torpedo boat formations which set out to attack convoys going up and down the east coast of Britain, which never reached the convoy. The convoy had its own screen, but before they reached the convoy, they would find themselves motoring along, and it would wait till they, they'd wait till they got really close range. And then suddenly, the Ds would turn on their engines turn on their searchlights, and start firing their guns. And it would be over very quickly. Now, 
the thing about the motor gun boats is that they end up being reclassified as motor torpedo boats by the end of the war. And there's a reason for that. By the end of the war, because of that, they can, fit, can be figured as gunboats or torpedo boats. They're reclassifying them back because they're thinking about sending them out to the Far East. Where the British are thinking about operations around Japan. And it's a really sort of interesting thing going on because the torpedo boats in terms of American configuration, American focus, are heading more and more towards the gunboat configuration as they're looking at that. And the British are going, well, we're probably going to get the... East China Sea side. We are a Sea of Japan, that sort of area. And we are probably going to have to deal with the potential of enemy vessels. And we don't want to be risking, in close areas, our larger vessels. If we can avoid it. We want to you know, keep them under air cover, use them where we need them. We don't want to have them doing the close patrols, dealing with any coastal freighters moving along. Okay. Enter the Fair Maldives. We can use these. We can configure and use these. And that was the plan. But that's also why, towards the end of the war, you find some boats being classified with motor torpedo boat numbers, and they don't have the ability to launch torpedoes because... They've had so many modifications to give them more guns, they no longer have the ability to launch torpedoes. Most crews do not go that far. Most crews do not go that far, in that they remove the ability to carry torpedoes altogether. But, as you can see with MTB-727, there is a torpedo capability there, and you can see it, but if you look at the other vessel, illustrated and pictured, the uh, MGB-606, you'll notice that um, she doesn't have the flaring to assist with the torpedo launch. She has lost that completely. Now that probably suggests she was built that way, and the most majority you know, are built in that way if they're in that configuration, but there's also some which end up that way after damage is corrected. Because that then configuration would support more guns. What can I say? They were ambush predators and they liked to be armed for it. And in proof that Vosper never, never can take the hint about the torpedo boat... They produced the 73 foot motor torpedo boat in 1943. Now, this is another cable vessel. There are two types of them produced. And roughly 29 end up in service. Three are failed to be completed in time of war. They are built with the capability of going 40 knots. The Type 2 is armed with a 6 pounder, two 18 inch torpedo tubes, 20mm Orlicon gun, and four of the uh, .303 Lewis guns. And basically, it, the Type 2 lost two 18 inch torpedo tubes in order to carry its 6 pounder. So that's the equation. If you have the two torpedo tubes, you can't carry the mass of the six pounder. If you lose two torpedo tubes, you can take and sustain the six pounder. I'd also, by the way, add that there are some interesting. Memories of some of these managing to gain a third six pounder as well. I'm not quite sure how much credence I put on that one. I can see them getting 40mm bofers. 
I can be really certain, probably certain, at least one possibly tried it. And it's like with these again, I'm, they start off, they're supposed to have 20 million units of Lewis guns. Again, I wouldn't be surprised if they change. Because the crews aren't stupid. The crews know they need more firepower. They know they're being built with what's available. Well, when something else is available, as far as they're concerned, and is better, they're going to nab it. And after this point, no real new types of torpedo boats are coming in. It's mostly modifications to original one, uh, to existing ones that come from this point. Principally because... Frankly, the wars reached that phase where that's no longer no longer a useful investment of resources. So here you go. We have a few survivors. Not many old torpedo boats survive, considering we are talking about literally thousands of craft produced. There are like a handful surviving around the world. Many of the ones that do survive are not in a configuration we would recognise as a torpedo boat. This is one of the earlier examples of a Vospa torpedo boat that was used to sell the idea to the Royal Navy of Vospa producing their fast torpedo boats instead of the more general purpose Fairmile designs. It's an interesting discussion really to think about why torpedo boats become gunboats and why they transition back and honestly it comes down to the same thing as sloops to the same things as all those vessels at a certain point small vessels are often designed with light enough weapon systems that they are easily reconfigurable just from the point of view of you can usually the weapon system is only held to the vessel by bolts I think these days we've got all sorts of radar and electronic systems which go into weapons. In those periods, it's literally a case of, well, we have a mount which is designed to take a machine gun. Yeah. How have we got, a gu have we got some people who are good at fabrication here? Yeah. Do you think we can alter that mount to take a 20mm cannon? Have we got a 20mm cannon? Dart revealed. We have some 20mm cannon. Think we can do that, sir. Excellent. The other advantage with small ships and smaller ships, which have fewer officers and the officers have to be more involved wandering around and their chiefs and everything, the team has to be far more integrated is that there is usually far more, especially with smaller crews, far more of a level of understanding going to be reached. In that, when you're dealing with a crew which is measured in hundreds, if not thousands, you become a corporate organization. You have to. The vast majority of people are going to be faces if that to you. If you are dealing with a vessel which has got a crew of a couple of hundred, everyone becomes a person. And you have to deal with that. As an off, you're going to know those people far more because you're going to bump into them far more. When you're dealing with a crew which is 14, 16 people, well, suddenly. Yeah, you have to salute me because I'm the officer. But in the nicest way, there's two of us on this sh on this boat. The rest of your ratings, I had better treat you all with respect and work with you rather than try to dominate you, because otherwise this ship will this boat will fall apart. Leadership is very different when you're talking about this size of crew. And also, what's different is the adjustment of the personnel, the adjustment of the needs. Once you're getting into the idea of using them as 
gunboats, especially. The thing that's going to go through all the crew's minds is speed of kill. They don't have armor. I know, some people are going to go, oh, well, they have armor plate around the bridge. That's not really any help. That's basically to protect the helms crew, uh, helmsman, etc. That's not really going to help them. So what do they need? They need firepower to put their opponents down quickly. There is never a battle which is more about who kills who first is going to be who hits who first hardest than when we have these fights between motor torpedo boats. Where everything is designed around speed and maneuverability and the firepower and everything else is an afterthought. When the Schnell boats have 37mm fitted, they have a fairly hefty weapon system for a motor torpedo boat. And it can cause a lot of damage. So ideally, what you want to do is hit them hard enough before they manage to get that onto you, that they aren't ever getting that onto you. So, thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed. Uh, this video, the Pacific and Baltic and Black Sea, will be live will be on next Thursday. The Long Patrol, i.e. the recorded video, will be next Saturday. And this week we have Ranging and uh, Stabilizing, How Gunnery Evolved from 1860 to 1960. Hope you enjoyed that. Thank you very much for watching, and take care. Oh, I usually do put a a question at the end of these, but I'm fairly sure my torpedo boats are not going to need to. But, um, I'd like to ask you what you think you're, the perfect balance is. Because all these vessels represent a slightly different picking on the scale of speed, size, firepower. Larger, faster, more stable, can carry more firepower, but also Bigger targets, less maneuverable, and at a certain point you're starting to get into destroyer territory. Versus the smaller ones where they can't operate in, as, in rougher seas, they can't carry as much firepower. So, I'd love to hear what you think it represents sort of the, the balance for a torpedo boat and a, and a motor gunboat. Thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed.